Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 114. Sleeping well at night with solid balance sheets. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. Today we're going to talk about dividend hikes, acquisitions, and how we sleep well at night with solid balance sheets. All that and more. See you on the inside. Hey, European DJ. How are you this weekend? (laughs) I feel really good. And, you know, uh, I mean, I'm laughing here. People can't see us. But we are wearing sweaters from Ahol Del Herze because two of our, I I believe, biggest fans, Rafa and Phil Sackler. And I think Phil was also on the show one time talking about the wheel option strategy. They they took for us these sweaters from the Albert Heijn and they sent it to us. So people, I mean, we're not, you can't see us here, but imagine us in a really ugly wrong blue sweater with albert hein logos full over us i mean that's how we're running this podcast and i just love it as an ahol shareholder it makes me really 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 proud i actually quite like this sweater i have to say i, I, really, I really like it and it fits it fits perfect so i i'm i'm more than happy with this it's it's pretty awesome but thanks to the guys i mean we can't get i can't get this this merch in ireland so it's pretty sweet that that i get to wear it and I think I'll have to wear it now every time for dividend day and maybe when I hold release their, their annual reports, but no, it's quite cool. Yeah. And then, then on top of that, talking about, uh, you know, really engaged listeners, also many mystery from, um, uh, Facebook and Alexander, who was also on our, uh, podcast the other day, they bought me some coffees again. So, you know, the trip is only to Ireland is only coming closer and closer and closer, you know? Who knows? We're, maybe we're, before Christmas, we will get you here. Don't you? Don't you worry? Christmas might be a nice time actually to get here. Once the, it's the weather. If if you don't mind rain, Christmas is good. But other than that, you it's uh, well, it's it's you nice. Know, rain we'll is get, a given. We'll get, we will get you here. But but hey, let's talk. Let's talk dividends. Dividend hike this week. Texas Instruments. We spoke about these guys before. I think we both have them. I don't have as many as I'd like. Building into it slowly i would say but man another well this is probably the lowest actually dividend hike in in a long time it was, it was single digits it's only 7.8 percent um but these guys these guys are just churning it out aren't they they're, they're really really showing some companies how it's done well you know i take it anytime i know it's single digits some people i saw on social media were disappointed with it but i really take it any time you know if you see that the st- stormy weather is uh, starting outside and we have seen some token hikes as well right like really disappointing then i'm really happy with this and guys you get it now the three percent yield three percent starting yield right texas instruments it's still like you know around the low 160s plus a 15 billion buyback program which didn't really hit the headlines a lot but this is a 10 percent of their market cap Usually they buy back like three to five billion per year, so maybe it will take them three years. But again, you know, three percent uh, share reduction per year also allows them to increase like like really nice the dividends. So, you know, the only thing that I always have in my mind uh, and I can't ignore it is, of course, you know, the the US dollar versus euro currency at one dollar, right? I, I, the price anchoring is in my head with one twenty, so I don't feel sometimes like going too aggressive on on american stocks and 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 being a bit more biased towards european stocks at the moment but still i mean texas instruments three percent yield i mean a year ago i could only dream about it then that's reality i mean a 7.8 percent increase is not to be sniffed at in this market i mean everything is is going down companies are struggling with cash flows as you said companies are given one two percent hikes eight percent on on the back of it is is pretty decent it's it's probably in line with inflation so they are they're keeping keeping up with inflation at the moment but uh i mean it, look it could be worse i, it could I be take Verizon. it anytime yeah, yeah i take exactly. it anytime 
Yeah, and then I mean, th there was a lot of news this week, right? Because yeah. Tor Capital, I know the Tor Capital has been uh, in many people's portfolios, also from our listeners uh, here. It's a real estate investment trust in the States. And it's going private for a 14 billion all cash acquisition deal with GIC and Oak Street. And, you know, um, this means a 20% premium on the last uh, closing price of stock. So many people saw a big jump. Question, of yeah. course, is like, should you sell it, sell it or hold it? I'm always quite uh, simple in this. If you already made up the premium and trading so close, then why wait? Because the time gives you an opportunity cost, right? You might take other undervalued stocks that have more growth potential in the share price. Of course, we're investing for dividends. On the other end, you know, um, the third quarter dividend is still supposed to be paid out. So yeah, but I would like to congratulate everyone that is owning store, specifically the ones that re bought it recently because you get this nice premium. I know it will have a bit of a tax impact, but don't worry about that. If you're a longer term shareholder and you're really used and addicted to the dividends, then yeah, I feel pity for you. It just so happens that uh, companies get acquired, right? And unfortunately, this one's going private, so it will be hard to participate in, in, in where it's being sucked up now. Yeah, I mean, this got a bit of a mixed reaction from what I seen on online. A lot of people were saying that this company sold them out. Just looking at the share price history, I mean, depending on when you got in on them, you, more than likely a lot of people probably didn't make money based on this. I mean, they, they traded above that $32 share price for, for a long time. We obviously had the crash during COVID. And then it was, it was to be fair, it was trending down downwards this year. But it was still up around forty dollars at the start of the year. So hopefully, hopefully people got in around COVID and are making some money from them. But I mean, as you said, that that's the risk, really, isn't it? Some companies can go private and and you lose that juicy four point eight percent dividend yielding. You have to try and replace that, which is quite tough. But. Yeah. Well, three M five percent. <laughs> yeah yeah and lawsuits coming out of coming out of every every hour of so no uh, li living on the edge <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we we had adobe like i mean i don't i don't follow them i don't, I don't know if they even pay a dividend but i do know there was a big big talk about these guys they dropped because they were uh they are being acquired are they by figma i believe for 20 billion uh, adobe is acquiring figma. acquiring yes yes and why this is such a big uh news because figma was probably in the design industry the biggest competitor of adobe so adobe as uh, adobe xd and um uh, and such and of course uh all the other things which really interest which really being used by for instance uh people that use also photoshop and such um, so really by designers and Figma is one of the industry leading tools when you think about user experience design, product design for many IT solutions. Companies like Microsoft use it a lot. Uh, yeah, so it's really an industry leader, but 20 billion, you know, wow. It, I believe it is a private company, Figma, but 20 billion, I think it's the sixth biggest acquisition in software in, in the history. I mean, LinkedIn was 26 billion. So it's a price tag, right? For something I kind of consider a niche industry still. Mm. Yeah. So 20 billion for a software company like that. And I mean, people will uh, fake my users will hate this. Yeah. To be purchased and acquired by, by the competitors, which in their opinion probably had an inferior product. So. It's really interesting and if you look at adobe right i believe it uh, does pay a really small no it doesn't pay a small dividend anymore that well, once in history in 2003 maybe uh, it paid a dis dividend but uh not over the last two decades right but the share prices was going nowhere with adobe many people stepped in at the height also last year it went really bonkers and then also the price dropped on the acquisition news so i don't know if adobe shareholders should be happy generally because i feel that they really really overpriced for figma uh, although it's it's a top-notch uh software product in their portfolio so so is that what is that what you feel that the market knows that they're paying way over the odds for this i mean they're buying their biggest competitor from what, what you say i have no i have no clue of the market so adobe are going to be the big fish now in that seat there's probably no one close to them but their share price drops 
yeah I but think. i believe i i read somewhere in an article 55 times annual run rate or something like that yeah and that's that's one of the metrics you use in in cloud businesses mm-hmm. i mean come on you know th- th- this, this needs to have a growth in figma which is like unseen and we are just we're just entering like stormy weather <laughs> no um yeah, it's, a it's it's a lot of money and and look i'm not a designer but I, at least i've heard of adobe i've never heard of figma in, in my life i actually have a pretty cool website i'm i'm, I'm looking at it there but i mean it seems like yeah figma is the figma is the suite you need if you want to design proper uh, it products i would say and anything uh, and else look, on top of that look, looking at some of the headlines i mean the financial times has the, dissecting adobe's dumb deal i mean that's the kind of that's the kind of feeling that's out there it's it's a dumb deal so it's, um... yeah, they just bought out the biggest competitor right uh, it's capitalism capitalism at its finest yeah, they bought it out but they, they're paying well over the odds by the looks of it yeah anyway not a dividend stock but i think it is worth to share in the news because this was big big news but then the other one uh, we spoke last week about it but it's finally confirmed we know now who the new ceo of shell will be and that is uh will sawan a lebanese canadian guy coming from the integrated gas renewables and energy solutions uh, business unit in shell i looked him up on linkedin he was in just a decade ago he was vice president commercial at Qatar in shell one of their lng businesses uh, a few years later, he became executive five, vice president deep water. So I went a big bit back to uh, deep black oil. Then he became upstream director in 2019, integrated gas direct in 2021. I mean, this is a hot shot. If you grow so quickly in a company like Shell, in a corporate like this, this guy is a hot shot. And he's, he's only 48. So he still has mm. like uh, 20 years to retire if we uh, take Ben from Bird as an. Uh, as a benchmark so yeah it, not it sure be, what to think about it but it's a hot shot there it could be a long 20 years or it could be it could be a nice 20 years depending on, on how it goes but yeah. look, we, we spoke we spoke about it last week it, yeah. it it looks like he has a decent record within the company he's obviously well thought of he's he's gone through the ranks quite quickly but there's one thing leading a department in a company and then another thing leading all the I, so. exactly he needs to be just a really good capital allocator in the tradition yeah. of uh, shell's history that's what he needs to be good so balance sheets balance sheets yes let's talk about balance sheets i mean look we we know at the moment the markets are crashing all around us i'm losing money left right and center i actually checked my portfolio for the first time today in in uh, probably in a month or so and it's it's red and it's down quite actually more than what i thought but luckily i'm not into the share price too much i'm a dividend investor dividend growth investor and one of the things we look at is a strong balance sheet so what makes tell us what makes a strong balance sheet well you know that's not easy to answer it depends of course uh, on the industry but you know it's just so important for us because look of course we want to see growing earnings and such right and growing cash flow especially because this gives us kind of certainty that the dividend is safe but on the other end if there is a bad year what do you need it's your balance sheet and you need to think about it similar to as your home situation if you have a bad year and you lose income you get a pay cut or whatever you know if you have one such a bad year or a bad month you need to be able to withdraw from your savings account and not straight away need to sell your assets yeah that's how i look at companies as well and this is why it's so important i mean if we are really entering a crisis here balance sheets will really show you the strength in your portfolio and um i don't i couldn't find the article anymore but not too long ago i also read an article that companies with a uh, strong balance sheet have generally um, better performance during crisis uh, uh, recessions and such because they have the ability to recover quickly yeah and 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 i think this is what we always talk about and jo- make jokes about about balance sheet flexibility because with a strong balance sheet you can also acquire companies at the bottom of a market of a recession right yeah. so this is why balance sheets are so important in my opinion and yeah i think 
uh, what I do once a year, I always look at the financial health of the companies that I have and and specifically taking this in mind like what if their shit hits the fan right what how how are we protected here so that's a little bit why for me the balance sheet is so important besides the cash flow statement besides the income statement i would say even the income statement for me is is the least important of the three financial statements yeah, i agree yeah and you really want to know like in times like this where you have high inflation and you, you want to know that a company can pay its debts quite comfortably. I mean, we, we spoke before of, of at and We spoke of them two years ago before we, we even entered into this. And we said, there's such high, high debt on their balance sheet. What happens when interest rates rise? They come under pressure. They struggle. Uh, they would end up probably have to be cut for companies like that. And, and even worse, that their solvency might be actually put into question. They, they certainly won't be able to go out and get more credit to, to grow or to buy companies or even to to pay for day to day stuff so it's quite for me it's quite important to look at how much debt they have and their ability to pay that back i mean that's that's really important how how can they pay that back or can they even pay it back uh, that's one of the most important things for me but we have to remember a balance sheet is just a snapshot in time isn't it so you 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 have to piece together our balance sheets maybe quarter by quarter but certainly year by year to to get a picture it's only it's only a snapshot at a particular moment in time yeah yeah true but you know if you want to go deeper you can always look at for instance the debt to equity ratio and it is always a bit blurry nowadays with companies that did a lot of buybacks but if you know what your what the quarterly cost uh, cost burn down rate is of a company right you can make some assumptions and you can feel you can look at okay how many quarters it would take for the company really getting into danger from a debt to equity ratio right and you can just look at the 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 income statement for that look at the cost part multiply that uh, or take it from the whole year let's say look at the balance sheet and how often you can put this in in your balance sheet before you get into the danger zone yeah. this is an easy way of doing a bit like uh, on the back of a napkin approach and it, it will give you safety usually if, if it's like one bad year maybe two bad years you should feel totally fine with this and also these companies will do cost cutting in those moments and none of these companies goes with revenue to zero overnight unless it's really a bankruptcy because they were in the middle of the blast zone yeah yeah but even then they should they should ride it out for one or two years then yeah, yeah. so so i'm quite conscious that we have a lot of listeners who are maybe new in the journey or starting the journey because we get a lot of a lot of questions in around this but for those not comfortable in reading a balance sheet and they, they don't know what is a good balance sheet what is this what is a weak balance sheet uh, what's a good place to start probably somewhere like moody's i think is is a good place where it gives you a credit rating i think that's probably yeah i think so i think so that look we often say that we don't trust analysts right um um, but that's more because of their incentives and moody's is a credit rating agencies and they study companies to to look at whether those companies can meet their obligations they look a lot at their balance sheet but they also look a little bit at future prospects of the company now the really simple thing is moody's it's with an uh, y right so not with ie but uh, y um if you go to moody's.com you can actually create a free account log in you can look up your company and they will tell you the balance sheet go to google you will see the uh, definition of the ratings as well uh, and and then you can really check whether it's like junk rating or a high grade so everything uh let's say from ba1 and lower is considered junk but everything above it is is, is considered investable so if you just look at those codes, you you already get a feeling of where your portfolio is at. Um, only in the great financial crisis, we have seen that also Moody's was not fully objective because they have strong relationships with Wall Street as well. Uh, I think the big short is a really good example of this. So you always need to stay kept skeptical and do a little bit of your own work, work here, homework, but i think moody's is a really good starting place for getting a feeling for how strong your positions are in your portfolio yeah yeah and and really you want to stay away from anything that's not investment grade i think that's a good starting point and actually i would go probably one step above that if i was starting out again 
which yeah. I'm not. Um, I would probably start with high grade and prime only. I would I would ignore upper medium and lower medium. We're going to get to sure. some of our positions in our portfolio, and <laughs> you might see that I don't follow my own advice. But if if I was to go back in time, I certainly would start with the, with the higher ones. Just get comfortable. Look at the the AAA ones. You're looking at your Microsoft, your Johnson Johnsons, and just study them. Just study that balance sheet and see what the difference that is compared to say a Walgreens and you, you'll see quite quickly which one is strong and then Walgreens which is probably going to be close to junk it's not quite it's still it's still in yeah. the medium grade but it's 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 getting closer to the junk so we think that's important yeah and, and there's another term that you hear financial analyst always saying it's a solvency ratio and you often yes. hear this around banks or insurance companies um the unfortunate thing is if you go to something like morningstar or something like that you won't see what their solvency ratio is and solvency ratios are you know effectively also calculated in in different uh, manners so for me the solvability is actually quite sig significant and important and what i look at is for instance the interest coverage rate yes yeah, so if we look at for instance net income how how much times is it covering the interest expense and honestly i i like it about five times yeah because then you have enough wiggle room uh, when 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 there's like for now high interest environment or something like that and a, and a contraction in earnings um, some companies have such a stable um business like an ahold they'll has a that they can afford a little bit more interest maybe than other companies uh, cyclicals you really want to watch out more there and the here you have also some more unknown terms like the quick ratio and the current ratio i think we touched upon this i, I realize it's a bit technical for some people but think about the quick ratio as really the ability of a company to to pay their short-term liabilities so debt that is expiring uh, within one year without needing to sell inventory or or take on additional debt yeah, so that they can really pay it, for instance, um, uh, from their cash. And this is also bringing it to the current ratio, which really um, um, looks at this. What, what, how can they uh, meet their obligations uh, for, for that debt, which is due in one year? So if they have more cash than short-term uh, liabilities, current liability, you're in a good position. And you always want this to be above one. Some companies are naturally lower. Why? Again if you have really predictable income like uh, companies that serve the bottom of the muscle of pyramid so like 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 again uh, consumer staples they can afford a little bit more right but some companies like cyclicals you want to see this a little bit better and and this all around solvability and solvency um here i, re I realize it's a bit technical but it's something that i take into consideration when looking at the financial health and also doing the analysis of the companies that i study yeah yeah i mean i agree interest coverage is probably one of the first things things that i look at um i quick ratio and current ratios i mean they're nearly the same um one just takes into consideration more inventories than than the other and then yeah, how quickly you can convert your cash and and, and pay off yeah I, th I think that's that's quite important but uh, i agree interest coverage is is up there i do look at debt equity as well um and then I, I also look at the assets i mean you you don't want them to see them setting off assets in order to pay off yeah pay off their debts you want to you want to see it quite strong so for, and you don't for me, yeah you don't want to see too much goodwill on the balance sheets there are balance sheets that our companies have like 30 or 40 percent in goodwill and you know that they will be reassessed during bad years and then then usually stock prices get hammered yeah so do, do you think do you think adobe is going to have a lot of goodwill on there oh <laughs> yes 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 and it will bite them like in three four years from now it will bite them really yeah yeah i know it, it it doesn't go away it doesn't go away i'm, I'm afraid but we've spoke about goodwill on that before and i actually completely yeah. forgot about, about goodwill here but that's a very good point. No, so so looking at your portfolio, right? So you have right, you, you have strong, high, medium, and weak balance sheets. Um, give us an example then of maybe a strong and a weak one, and, and why they're strong and why they're weak. 
So for me, for instance, I've got Microsoft, Apple, and Johnson & Johnson in the top 10 of my portfolio, right? And the top 10 of my portfolio is 52% of my entire portfolio. So these are the companies that I always pay a little bit extra attention to. But, you know, think about Microsoft, Apple, and Johnson & Johnson. I mean, these have, these have just pristine balance sheets. I mean, if you go into their balance sheet and look up the debt to equity ratio or even the cash positions, these are companies that can pay off their entire debt in a single year, even less. Yeah, and and specifically Microsoft as an example. So think about again your own bank account. Think about that that you are having a house and that, and you have debt on your house and you just have so much cash on your balance uh, on your on your savings account that if shit hits the fan that you say to your other half, your wife, you know what? Let's just. Uh, pay off the house at once, you know, in one go. Now, that's the quality of these companies. This is what we're talking about. If you need to, to buy a car, it's like they don't need to use credit card. They buy it straight out of cash with, with the blink of an eye. These are those kinds of companies. And they have so much cash flow coming in that their cash balance sheets are still growing. Yeah. And I, I looked up Microsoft like half a year ago or something like that, even with their buybacks and their dividends, they're still hoarding cash at the same time so this is a triple a balance sheet we just re referred to moody's triple a uh, exxon mobil had triple a in 2016 until the oil crisis happened they dropped to aa2 today which is still like a high high medium grade balance sheet uh, apple is a new joiner in this in this triple a balance sheet group since i think a year ago or something like that so yeah now i i have the only three triple a companies in the world they are all part of the top 10 of my portfolio as an example yes i i have two i have microsoft johnson johnson but one thing i did learn doing this was out of my top 10 i've got microsoft johnson johnson and i got shell so i got two prime and then one high grade and then the the rest of my top ten are uh, upper medium grade and lower medium grade, which I'm not actually quite quite impressed about myself. To be fair, um, I've got companies like Altria, Walgreens, Ahold, British American Tobacco, and Basf. So they all range from A1 down to B A A3. Um, so for for those that don't know i i definitely think we should maybe try post this picture somewhere but a1 to a3 is upper medium grade then you got b a a1 to b a a3 and that's lower medium grade and anything below that is junk so thankfully i have no junk which which i'm a little bit happy about but but definitely one of my goals for the year was to focus more on quality and and i still think i need to do some some work and improve on my top 10 positions based on quality and and balance sheet because i think this year more than ever as you, as you said is companies that will come out of this slump or if we go into recession will be the yeah. ones with the strongest balance sheets yeah and remember oil was dead right but then shell and exxon mobile are closely behind microsoft apple and johnson johnson with their balance sheet strength i mean i did a video the other day they have like an uh, a gearing which is debt to equity of 27 or 25 percent some of them went to the low 20s just in one or two years paying paying down debt i mean come on guys oil these oil companies i mean they are so well managed right and they are so excellent in managing the cycles yeah so i still sometimes wonder like why are people is it really like that people are just against oil and therefore also treat the stocks as shit because you know it they aren't yeah i'm biased of course with all my oil but yeah yeah but they, they are quite cyclical and and you know people's minds do crazy things particularly like when you're in when it's in the, the middle of a crisis or when when something yeah. really bad i mean COVID happened nobody knew when it was going to end there was no cars in the road there was no planes in the sky oil was after dipping it was it was nearly uh, you could nearly get paid to get a barrel of oil at one stage it was it was so low uh, so yeah, that's when we were buying exactly but it, it's it's hard it's hard it's hard for people and we're seeing something yeah, similar in this true. market now the market's that's crashing now we have everything dropping and it's 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 hard to buy when when that that's happening but i think right now is a good time to buy but i think focusing on strong strong balance sheets is probably a good place to start yeah so i've got only one company in my top 10 that i'm always a bit concerned about the balance sheet and that is upfi 
Mm. So if you look at the lowest grade be above junk, I've got Ahol Del Heze and Danone and Apfi. Ahol Del Heze and Danone guys, really don't worry about those companies. Those are consumer staples. They have such predictable um, revenues and earnings and cash flows. That's why you see in the consumer staple industry that they take on more debt than other companies. And also bank confidence allow them to do so. Yeah, because people don't suddenly stop buying butter and milk and everything. So it's so predictable. So I, I really don't mind them being in that category. But Apfi, you know, Apfi is giving me a little bit of chills here. Um, I love it for the dividend. But this is really more of a transformation story after also the allergen acquisition and the Humira, um, I said, of patent expiration. And they're doing everything right. Together with Dividend Wave, we are really every quarter doing the calculations again. We only want them to see paying down debt because their debt are extraordinary high levels. And if they don't manage to continue to pay down debt, the dividend is definitely at risk within two, three years. Yeah. So that's why Apfi for me always is the one that I'm concerned around in my top 10 in my portfolio. And the only thing I really, really track there is the balance sheet. Yeah. You've, you've, I think you did. Did you do something? Did you do a video or an article where you, you compare them all? And Abby, it could assist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. As, as an area of concern for you. Yeah. And then what, what, what is the company in, in, in your uh, top 10? You mentioned Walgreens and such, but w which is the one that really you feel like uncomfortable with going into this balance sheet, uh, with, into a crisis with this balance sheet? Definitely AT and T. I mean, they are they are deputies. You still own them? I still have them. I'm still holding. Yes, I still <laughs> I still have them. But uh, I I I can see another dividend cut. I really can. Uh, particularly the way the way things are going. I don't at the moment. I'll back up at a seven percent yield. I would not be surprised to see them go down to about four, three or four percent. And and uh, personally, if they did that and, and paid <laughs> start paying down that debt, it would not be too bad of a move. But I mean, it doesn't look like they've started to do that anyway. So we'll 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 see. We'll have to pay close attention to them. But they are they are they are the one that I'd be worried about the most. So do you have with AT and T the same as what I have with Buyer that you are you know you shouldn't own it, but you still own it, hoping for yeah, a I, return? I think I'm so far in the shit now that I just have to just stay there and just paddle around for a bit and yeah and hope. I mean, I mean. Uh, the company's not going to go away. We we need. I may we, hope we so for company. their clients. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the company can't go can't go away. Can't really go anywhere. The infrastructure, the services is is needed, but it's just that at what cost? What what happens? And it's but the they dividend, can, really. They could go bust and 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 restart, right? And just wash out all the shareholders and like like General Motors did or something like that in the Great Financial Crisis. They could, they could. Yeah, uh, the assets will still be there, and then they have probably what is it called, Chapter Eleven, and they move on and uh, they do a, a giant reset. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Put my put my mind right at ease there. <laughs> yeah. No, but they, no, they, they, they are they are the biggest risk, and I look, I knew that whole lot to them. They were they were always going to be a risk. I, I didn't inspe didn't expect inflation and all this to hit at this time I, I thought they cut the dividend they go back to their core and we see how they pan out after two years and then we have all this yeah. shit in the middle so it's 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 a difficult time for them but i honestly i would not be surprised to see another dividend cut next this, yeah. this year next year so uh, to your defense right uh, in your top 10 when i look at the tickers in there and the companies it it shows me that you've been investing only since three years or something like that because those were all the uh, companies that had an attractive yield over the last three years. Mm. Yeah. So, and I think many people that have started out, let's say in 2020 with dividend investing, we were at exuberant prices. So it is really hard for people to have picked up Johnson Johnson at a decent yield. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's why I fully understand that in your portfolio, if you have had a criteria like 3% yield, that you have Altria, Walgreens. Bus F, Aholt, um, Bridge American Tobacco, AT&T, Unilever. It's a result of the time period that you've been investing mm. in. And I see it also in my portfolio because I've not been buying Microsoft uh, for a very long time. 
Apple neither, right? But these were all from, let's say, 2015 or something like that. Yeah, so now on my Microsoft, maybe after the dividend hike, I will have a 5% yield on cost. So, and I think many people, many listeners might ha have this as well, right? Your portfolio is a result probably of the last few years here. Um, so this is also the time that is coming up now to really invest in quality. And th this is difficult because if you're, if the share prices drop, you get those same stocks like Walgreens suddenly earning 8%, in, uh, let's say, in dividend income. And then you'll see Johnson Johnson 3%. What, what, what will you do? It's so attractive to take the 8% and thinking like, oh, I can lock it in now forever. Yeah. 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 And and kidding yourself always that it's a turnaround and that they'll turn this around and you get yeah. caught in, in all these companies. And to, to be fair, I Walgreens and that were my highest positions. They're now dropped down dropping mm -hmm. down as, as i focus more on other but it is you're right it's so hard when you see everything dropping you have a seven percent eight percent yield or a two and three percent your mind automatically goes okay I'm, I'm trying to generate income how much income can i generate i like walgreens i'll buy walgreens whereas a matter of fact walgreens have their have their issues cvs is probably a better a better option if you are to the balance yeah. a, a lower yield probably probably better manage better run but yeah it's, it's yeah, but to take said. take Texas Instruments now, right? You can get it now the three percent four watch yield. Yeah, uh, let it grow seven point two percent annualized per year. In ten years, it will be six six percent uh, yield on cost. I mean, if that's the time you want to retire, that's really really not that bad. Yeah, maybe maybe mm -hmm. Walgreens goes from eight to ten percent, but maybe Walgreens goes from eight to four percent because of the risk in their dividend. Yeah, so this is really the time to start nibbling in in those high quality stocks like texas instruments as an example i still think that microsoft is too unattractive from a dividend growth point of view the yield is just too low to make up to make it up over the next decade but guys this is the time to go for quality and and look back at your plan if your plan is a starting yield of three percent for every investment you make and it needs to grow let's say in my case six percent annualized in dividend this is the time to start focusing more on quality really this is the time to improve your portfolio sweet uh let's maybe look at some listener questions we have quite some to get through and alexandra has asked us he's opening a nice bottle of wine right now i wonder what kind of bottle of wine he is drinking um but he's asked us do you or have you owned any alcohol companies which ones and why I, I bought my first Polish stock this year. It's called Ambra SA. It's a small cap um, here. Um, it actually increased and hiked their dividend by 6% uh, this week from 95 groschen to uh, a zloty. Um, it's a small position and they produce a lot of spirits for Poland and some other countries in Eastern Europe. It's a relatively good growing business. There is a lot of risk involved at the moment with the ukraine uh, russia uh what is it intervention or something like that but it's just a bloody horrible war um but that's uh that's the one Ambra, and i still think it's in a good value zone uh to be honest how about you uh, do you own any diago no Diageo. i would love I, lo I would love to own diageo but the there's still the price is just going up and up and up i do expect if we do hit a recession that it should maybe come back down um but i would love to own them of course they own guinness which is which is irish so i, yeah. I, I really i've been waiting and waiting and it's it's one of these companies knowing you keep wait, waiting for it to yeah. drop and it just keeps going up the other way so maybe it might get to a point where it's just not going to drop to where i want to but at the moment i still think it's a little, a little bit overpriced for my liking and what about uh, what is it Louis Vuitton, uh, Moe's Hennessy, uh, um, LVMH? Mo yeah, they do uh, Hennessy's whiskey and yeah. Moe champagne. Yeah, um, that that's also a really great dividend stock, right? To own. Yeah, and then Still, you get luxury I, brands. I can't, I can't remember. We, did we look at them recently? And they were they were quite richly priced as well. They are always richly priced, like L'Oreal. Yeah. Yeah. But we have um, also Heineken. We know they cut their dividend also the other time. We have An Anhus Inbev, or what is it? Which is Carsberg also as well. 
Carlsberg yeah. was one was an interesting. Oh, one, wasn't yeah, it? yeah, exactly, Carlsberg. So maybe Alexander, you should switch from wine to beer and check out Carlsberg. Yes. <laughs> um, Tim, Tim has asked us. Okay, so if the coming generations will consume less and be more conscious consumers, what type of companies do you believe will thrive in this environment, and should it affect how you build your portfolio? Um, honestly, I do not believe the coming generations will be more conscious consumers. And I'm basing that off, I mean, I've, I've a child nearly a teenager and lots of cousins, a lot nieces, nephews that range from 18 all the way down to like 10, 11. And they have zero mass on money. They buy nothing but designer brands. They won't, like, none of them go to, I don't know what kind of stores you have. We had this called Pennies. It's Primark in, in, the, in the UK. And it's cheap clothes. You go in. I I I, I go in and buy a T-shirt for two euro. You will not see the younger generation buy anything like that. Um, it's yeah. all Nikes, Adidas. Uh, honestly, I I I know we live in a little bubble online, and, and you see lots of people. But generally, when I when I look outside and I see consumer spending, everyone has iPhones, I I yeah. earpods. The, the whole lot. Everyone just seems to buy more and more and more and, and you know they probably can't afford it all i just can't see i just can't see it being more conscious unless we have a deep depression that lasts maybe three four five years and it, yeah. it mentally affects people but i just can't can't see it that's probably sorry tim to say this but it probably says more about you <laughs> than about the world because if i look at my portfolio you, 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 consumerism everywhere and I'm with you. If I look at my kids, I mean, I'm really frugal. I'm conscious. And then, uh, to, to still to answer your question, right? For me, this is the reason why I'm I'm still bullish on Danone. They struggle with execution, but when I think about conscious, I think also in the sense like, for instance, uh, from a climate change, eating less meat. So, what is a typical replacement? Is is for instance, um, uh, no, not not you consuming, for instance, dairy milk. But um, uh, like, was it milk based on, uh, based on these um, nuts and everything, right? Plants and yeah, uh, plant plant based milk. That's the word, yeah. Uh, because we know we we need less. Um, I said less cows and everything that produce a lot of CO two as well. And instead of trev instead of the the vegetables we need like corn to feed the cows, it travels straight away through our bodies and not via their body. So when you think about being conscious, that's where I look more at conscious, like food conscious, and then climate change as a trigger. So that's why I'm looking, for instance, a company like Danone, but really less consuming. I don't, I, I really don't observe those trends other than more in, in, in my circle where people come with a university study are really concerned about the world, but remember, People that finish university in some countries is less than ten percent of of the entire population. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, the world is quite a big place. There's I don't know how many billion in the world now. So maybe yeah. if America starts struggling, you might see China, India, they'll come up. And uh, yeah, there's, I, I think consumerism is is not going to go away quite yeah. quite quickly. Um, Miss M Manny mystery so my next addition to my portfolio is most likely to be the tool group ticker t-h-u-l-e um have you looked at the company before and what are your thoughts on the consumer discretionary sector i believe we both looked at it before right i don't remember i, I know this is quite quite popular in in our group um but i don't think we looked at it it's a swedish yeah. swedish company i believe but i i honestly I, I don't i don't know a whole lot about them so okay so so i did it one time uh many in one of my videos not too long ago i think about european stocks look i like the company a lot i and specifically their products high quality products um people want those products i do believe that if we are facing a recession it can go two ways one people stop buying flights to expensive destinations start going camping again and they will need the gear and go to Tula group yeah to, to buy their equipment on the other hand it might also result in less sales because our people are maybe even not going on holiday at all and are going for the cheaper alternative because they are premium priced 
Um, from a technical point of view, let's say the company, um, they did cut their dividend in, uh, how you say it, during the depth of COVID, but they then paid out an additional div dividend a year later. If you ignore them for that, they have been growing their dividends since 2014, actually quite aggressively. You can get them now at a PE of 12.8 based on the on the on the most recent uh, uh, trailing 12 months earnings, a dividend of 5.7 percent. So, you know, my fair value is 243 uh, Swedish crowns. It's currently trading at 230, slightly undervalued, six percent. Uh, but I would like to live with a little bit of a margin of safety uh, here. So. Probably I will buy it at the low two hundreds. Yeah, you, you you click something in my brain when when you you were talking. Now I don't know if we we've studied them. We have definitely talked about them on on the show before, um, but they've caused quite a stir in in the group and on Twitter. Have they dropped dropped in price or has something happened? Uh, I believe they did a profit warning uh, or ah, something okay. like that. Yeah. yeah. That that's fair enough. Yeah, I, I I think I mean if they're if they're premium brand branding camping, people are coming back. In my mind, and what what I would personally do is probably shop for a, a cheaper alternative. Yeah, that's, me too. That's just me. That's just me. But, yeah. Um, very good. Um, so we have a question from Mike, and he's asked us at what price point would you consider adding to your Microsoft position? Um, honestly around these price points, um, but not for myself, for my kids' portfolio. I've got a, a multi-decade time horizon there. If it would be for my own portfolio, it would be probably around 200, 180. But if it's for my kids, uh, I'm actually considering at the moment to buy them one share each. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much price anchored on this one. I have 180 in my head, and that's what I want them to come down to. Um, <laughs> no matter what <laughs> no matter what i wanted to come down but, but the, since the, you're this... since the price in your head revenues have been growing with 40 50 percent so <laughs> yeah i need to i need to increase my head by 40 or 50 percent but yeah that, that that's the price i had when i last looked at them my i had this the last time remember before i bought them i wanted them to come to for a member about a hundred and I got them at 120. Uh, I bit the bullet and said, "Ah, I'm just gonna." And then they shot. They shot right up. Um, so maybe I just have to have to stick to that mindset. But it's it's hard with Microsoft. I always I, I check it every every so often, and it always seems to be coming down. I'm like, okay, it's definitely coming down to yeah. 180. And then I look again the week after, and it's gone back up to to areas. So it's 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 one of those ones that I have in my head at, at price anchor. But I, I really need to sit back down and 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 analyze them again and, and as you said i did that about two years ago um so i have a certain price in my head but i need to refresh refresh my thinking um john has asked us thoughts about averaging down on a stock that's in the negative yeah uh i mean today almost everything is negative um he also mentioned here like maybe it's just better to only average up effectively right that, that's the the thinking here um i mean averaging down for me it is sometimes difficult but i've got rules in place because sometimes uh, you can also f catch a falling knife so i i scale my positions so let's say if i uh, let's imagine 100 percent position that i envision i would not buy more than 15 or 20 percent every time when i buy something and i would for instance not buy more than once or twice per month and i would not buy more than half a position in let's say half a year because i don't need to have a full position within within a month so what i'm actually put doing is i'm putting rules in place so that i i i can see how the company is doing because sometimes the yeah. price is a leading indicator of the business quality and that's effectively it yeah, I I think there's a difference in in a bull market when a company is dropping in price or negative, and in a bear market or a market that's dropping like now where the overall yeah. market is dropping. Yeah, true. Uh, I th I, th I think there's a difference there. If we're in a in a market where everything is going up, um, like we have for the last ten years, and your your company is dropping and it's going negative, 
I would definitely pay a lot more attention and say, okay, it's negative. There must be a reason why it's negative. In an overall bear market, it, it's going down anyway by external issues. So my thoughts on that is depending on your time horizon, what your thoughts of the company and, and as you said, do they have a strong balance sheet or, or can they get out of this nest in two or three years, then I'd have no problem in, in averaging down when, when it's negative. But again, for me, I, th I think it's distinctive. I don't think it's black and white saying do not buy a stock because it's negative and average down and the same. Do not average up as well because you 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 have to take everything as as in isolation. I, I just don't think it's black and white. But for me, I don't really see the problem in averaging down if there's an overall market and, and you know that it's external pressures on the market and, and everything is fine. Um, Tiago, how much of your portfolio would you allocate to Apple at these prices? I assure you this is completely unrelated to the Apple put he just sold. <laughs> <laughs> um i'm not looking at apple at all at this moment in time uh, the yield doesn't attract me enough yeah i mean if you if you like them at these these prices they were a lot lower this time last year i think so um that's true that's true yeah, and, and and what what has changed between this year and last year apart from they released new products there last week or the week before but for me at uh, these prices no I, I again i'm price anchored with these i'd love to see these come down 120 100 and maybe consider adding them because I just want to own some Apple. They're a quality company, but they're not uh, on the top of my wish list, put it that way. No, and, and still 25 PE, a dividend yield of 0 0.6. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I would need to see it probably in the, in the low hundreds, and then I would treat it more like for my non-dividend part of the portfolio. My Apple is just in there because it was trading at a 13 PE like several years ago. Um, it was at that moment in time everyone was saying like iPhone is dead, it's not coming back. Um, so yeah, that was a perfect time to buy, um, I must say. And also with a uh, good yield on cost now, let me quickly check. It is now a yield on cost for me of 3.1%. Uh, yeah, So it's paying off effectively. But uh, I also had a decent entry yield at that moment in time of 1.8 or 1.9%. Um, dividend XC, uh, have you have you guys heard of the Swedish powerhouse Investor AB? Uh, beautiful stock, beautiful company. What's your take? He also put a song in there, which is a great Irish song by the Dubliners called "In Rare Old Times." It's a it's a actually a nice Irish song. <laughs> Well, I, I quickly looked them up, right? And I looked at uh, Investor AB is effectively an investment vehicle. Let's call it like Berkshire Hathaway a little bit, right? Um, there were two companies I liked in their portfolio a lot. is Electrolux, because I love their products, and ABB. But I don't like their portfolio enough to invest in it. I will probably invest in those individual stocks myself, those that I like, and not in the rest. Dividend-wise, I mean... If you look at their dividend chart uh, from the start of the 2000s, it looks really good. They cut their dividend uh, with the dot-com bubble. They cut their dividend slightly in the Great Financial Recession. Then they had rapid growth of their dividend over the you know, you know, know, money printing period. They yeah. had to cut their dividend bit during COVID again. So I can imagine why he's really proud on it, but for me, if I look at the portfolio, I'm not so optimistic about the next decade, let's say, with what they have. So they might be great capital allocators, but I would really need to study them more. Yeah. A lot of love for Swedish stocks lately, actually, isn't it? We talk about Castellum and then we have, have this. They have some great companies. Yeah. Um the next question is, I can't pronounce it. Nice. We'll go, yes, we'll, we'll stick with that. So long-term view on FedEx uh, that got slaughtered today and other companies in that sector. I mean, you may say this one. <laughs> I mean, look, FedEx came out and said pretty much what we all knew, what we're all thinking, and, and they got slaughtered. Um, overall, I, I think we spoke about these and UPS on, on, our, yeah. on our show before. Um, I can't remember what their balance sheet or what their cash flows are like, um, but I, I do remember very poor. That I do remember thinking they were way overpriced, and 
that the dividend was in trouble at the time and i don't see any any reason or anything in this market to, to change our mind otherwise well i just quickly looked it up on uh, roic uh, dot uh, what is it ia this website you can look here at 30 years of uh, um, history of balance sheet history uh, roic dot ai and you know continuously their free cash flow is lower than their uh, net income and this is really a red flag that means that they are beefing up their uh, income statement probably they have a lot of one-offs uh, or something like that that they pull back into the income statement but their cash flow is just horrible like horrible in 2017 negative 2018 negative 2019 hardly in the positive 2020 in the negative yeah and then the COVID years of course right yeah. this is just not a company that you want to own i studied them in the past fedex has a really it's really really poor at cash flow generation that's why i stayed away from it yes i have been sometimes flirting a little bit with it uh here because you know yield and such it made me look into them again but every time the cash flow the free cash flow scares me this is not the company that i consider to have a you know uh, yeah it's not a cash cash generating machine yeah, I mean, they did take advantage really of of COVID. We can see that in in the numbers. Yeah. The previous ten years before that were quite quite dreadful. Um, yeah. So I, no, look, I'm staying I'm not, away. I'm not surprised, but I, I, I as, like you, I'm I'm staying away. And you you talk about solvency. Remember, we said interest coverage, yeah. and they're consistently two point seven, four point one. Uh, they're at eight point seven now, to be fair, but it's always it's always on the lower end of of what I like. So yeah, for me for me. FedEx and it's not a company that I that I was interested in. Um, so we'll we'll stay we'll stay away. They do have a, a PE ratio of ten, which is probably attracting some people. But I mean, yeah. But also, then I would I I mean, without having studied UPS in the last uh, few months, I would always go for UPS uh, as a first consideration. Then because I, I I just find them a better managed company from what I look at as a dividend investor then they also increased their dividend massively not too long ago i hope they are not shooting themselves in their own feet here uh, but ups stands out to me as a better managed company yeah. Yeah. but maybe the next one i would love this to ask one for you and it's uh, to you and it's from le collecteur de dividendes one of our french colleagues i believe is asking how do we feel in the current bearish environment he finds it difficult to keep positive even though he knows that we should look at it as if the market was on sale but still long-term view is not always easy to keep in mind i i agree it's it's easy it's easy to sit here and say to say uh, long-term view and and stay positive it, it is really hard for me luckily i've been i've been so busy and work over the last this this whole year that i've barely had time to to check my portfolio i think i mentioned at the start i checked it today for the first time in, in a month and it was down a lot and i'll be honest when i see that you get that initial oh wow it's 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 down it was down by five figures which is which is a lot which is a lot for me but i'm i would i would first of all just try and stay away from social media and, and bad news I'm, I'm doing that by default but then sometimes you have to think look just look at the past look look what's happened we've had bear markets we've had markets that lasted two and three years and and we come out of it so just try and focus on quality and also if you're a dividend growing investor which i assume you are focus on that income that dividends going up i mean what i did directly after that is i looked at what i've earned in dividends this year and i earned close to three thousand which is which i think it was at just under two thousand last year and i still have a couple of months left in the year so that keeps me motivated just seeing that income come up rather than the the share price that's that's how i try and stay positive so you know and, that, and you touched on a really good point there so le collector de dividendes uh, you know you might have seen on my website i've got a portfolio dividend portfolio tracker on there actually if you go to the dashboard it says nothing i believe about the share price yeah only one thing is maybe portfolio value is one chart which which you update maybe once three but everything is talking about dividends straight in the face if you go to the even to the portfolio uh, worksheet in the template you see share price and you see a little bit about portfolio value 
but it doesn't tell you how much it's down it doesn't tell you anything of that i did that on purpose because i don't want to be tricked into this situation to get uh hooked into the share price thinking i want to be tricked into the situation of dividends are my dividends dropping or growing so also what i like in such a bearish environment is just looking at like you know entering the dividends that are coming in in the transaction sheet i mean that's where the power comes in and that and that wires me again into thinking like oh which great company i can buy now uh, to hook in those dividends because i'm so laser focused on growing my dividend income because that's my sole prime goal to reach financial independence share price really, really doesn't matter and i must say while my portfolio grew over the years it became easier for me to not have that because in the beginning it was like all oh, my savings my my wealth my this feeling was really strong eight years later i i mean we were talking before the show we we checked our both portfolios my portfolio went down by a month that is like nine months of capital investments for me and actually it hardly did me anything right uh, like maybe a split second that i felt like whoa few vacations here right but but the dividends i mean i hope you get to that phase quite quick enough because it gives you more mental freedom i would say yeah it, it depends on where you are in your journey as well doesn't it because yeah, if you exactly say you say you only start or you started two years ago and and your portfolio is probably down overall i mean yeah. whatever you've invested you probably have less if you started eight years ago ten years ago chances are that what you have invested you I'm probably still the plus. yeah exactly, exactly. Of, and, and that has a big difference as well so i i, I can completely understand um yeah. i'm with you on it if, if honestly if i had more free time i would probably be the same but i would probably panic a lot more and, and make stupid decisions exactly. so I'm, I'm, I, I'm quite happy i'm not active on social media too much lately because there's just so much noise and i think in, in bear markets you just need to keep cool collected and, and think okay I'm focused on this company. This company will be here in five years. It should grow its revenues by this, this, and this, and and I'm happy. So, and and go back to your plan again, right? Yeah. Uh, my calculator says three point twenty five percent or three percent investment starting, six percent annual growth. Stick to that, and, yeah. Stick and, and to that know, plan. Do you know my plan says nothing, not one thing about share price growth. Share price. My neither. My neither. Not one nothing exactly um life with dividends um today's news is riddled with the fedex ceo claiming a worldwide recession i i mean i don't think he's saying anything we didn't know but are you guys building up a war chest for a potential mega sale i'm actually already since a while trying to get my war chest empty because i've had for many years a war chest which was not enough consumed so no no I, I i'm really coming more to the conclusion that just dollar cost averaging everything that i can have beyond my um i said beyond my uh emergency fund is probably a better way to do yeah how about yeah, you i i'm i'm still putting the same amount of money in every month i have some money on the side but i fear if i was to keep it and wait i i would try and time the market yeah. and then i would i would i would lose and that that's my that's my one fear and and honestly if i was to do that you would thank me because the stock market would definitely go back up <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and do exactly, the opposite exactly. of, of what i want so yeah. i think for me it's it's easier to take out emotions and just put in the put in the same amount and yeah. um, herman has asked us our thoughts on flow traders could it be the rio tinto like of dividend stock view um i remember the good old days of dividend wolf i don't know if you remember and he yeah. had quite a good in-depth article um on flow traders they are quite cyclical they do well in turbulent markets so they probably be doing quite well now actually um i haven't looked at them this year i had them in my portfolio last year i sold them they had a high dividend yield they got the dividend got out um but i haven't looked at them again since i'd, I'd like to actually revisit them and see what what they're doing and how they're doing in in this market in, in a bear market i know they do high frequency trading but I, I honestly don't know how they would fare out in a bear market I, I don't understand i'd have to i'd have to read it again to it but at the time they had a really high dividend i did a dividend capture on them worked out quite quite well and i was happy but 
they um seem like a, a decent company but again it's a different market now so i, I don't know i don't know how they will perform in a, in a bear market yeah good then the next question is from uh, remco kamerman and he's asking what resources do you use he has made his own spreadsheet like most he thinks and he can see at a glance where to allocate that month funds yeah in which stocks i guess if equal he is currently biased towards euro stocks due to it being his yeah. currency yeah I, I think spreadsheets are are probably the go-to i had a g sheet that i deleted um and i am actually in the process of just building a dashboard i'm using c sharp and, and python to build myself a dashboard in a database so i will never delete that um some members of the community helped me they gave me some power source that i can pull from interactive brokers and and sort out my my information quite quickly so i'm in the middle of building that i, I don't have the heart to go back into a g sheet and start building it from some scratch um so i'm going i'm going the long-winded way and building my own i know you have a couple of g sheets so it's quite an easy one for you yeah and, and, and remco you can grab that from our website but i think he is also suggesting here a kind of a watch list yeah uh, because he can see at a glance where to allocate uh, that amount of funds so i've got uh, one g sheet where i've got my all my 40 stocks of my allocation strategy i've got them in there for yeah. most of them i've got a, a fair value price calculated uh, i've then also often shared them in the videos and then for those um i have kind of a formula saying like should i consider buying it or not and that's typically when the yield is decent plus under fair value pops up and then that's something that i often look at uh, of what to buy at next time i've got a whiteboard right behind me and i have all, all the companies on my watch list and, and my fair price so that's there what you I, go that's what i use yeah. um future dividends thoughts on ticker symbol wsm they keep growing and executing well in the market um i'm not too familiar with with these guys wsm williams uh, sonoma incorporated I, I i haven't heard of them before no me neither never so it's something we need to do our homework on i guess uh, i'll quickly have a look and see what what they are what they are like they do they dividend yield 2.2 percent buyback yield 14.8 percent they look they, they they look all right 4p ratio of 8.2 consumer discretionary sector i mean i look I, I don't know enough about the company but at a glance they 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 look decent i'm sure um and i'm sure if if you think that they are executing well in the market they must be some sort of decent company but honestly we we don't read these questions before we we just put them in and then we go through them live um but it might be might be one to add on my board behind and to look at in the future same here no no clue about the company sorry good does this mean that we're coming to the end of the show right yes yes i'm afraid so that was the that was the last question um good. Th thanks a million to everyone we, look, we get lots of questions we try our best to to answer them all sometimes as you said we we just post these live we answer them live because i think it's better that you get our natural reaction to some of these questions um, so apologies if we can't answer all of them in full or, or how you would like. Um, but again, keep them coming and we will see you all next week.